Right. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this really important session we have today on the Count Community Health Workers launch event. I would first like to thank um, the organizers alongside the Global Fund, the Community Health Impact Coalition, UNICEF, CHI, the Clinton Health Access Initiative, Living Goods, and the Health Geolab. And I'd like to give thanks, say thank you to our participants. And I'd start by thanking Margaret Adera, who is a certified community health worker, a mentor mother for mothers living, women living with HIV, and an advocate for CHWs um, from Kenya. I'd like to give thanks also to the other participants. Uh, first of all, um, my great friend and colleague, um, uh, Raj Punjabi, Dr. Raj Punjabi, um, the um, coordinator for the Presidential Malaria Initiative um, in the United States, Dr. John Wanyungu, Ministry of Health Kenya, Dr. Brahimi Kone Ministry, from the Ministry of Health Mali, Dr. Paul Kampari, Ministry of Health Burkina Faso, and of course, Maureen Adidans from UNICEF, who will moderate the session um, and also talk more about the initiative. And I want to thank the many people and partners, um, I hope many of you are on this call today, who have contributed to the development of the implementation um, support guide for developing a national geo-referenced community health worker master list. And above all, above all, I want to thank the thousands, tens of thousands of community health workers and other frontline health and care workers who are saving so many lives and having so much impact on both individuals and communities across the world and are putting their own health at risk in many situations, particularly in the context of uh, the pandemic. Before we, I hand over to uh, Maureen to talk about um, the new guidance, um, I just want to make a couple of um, observations from the experience of the Global Fund. To start with, we see community health workers as an absolutely essential part of how we deliver on the promise of health and well being for all. They extend the reach of the formal health systems, they are part of the communities they serve, they are extraordinarily flexible in their ability to respond to the particular needs of localities of communities of different populations. We have seen the strength of community health worker networks in this pandemic, training, informing, providing testing, helping people seek treatment. We've seen them play crucial roles in fighting malaria, HIV, TB. We've seen them across the spectrum of primary healthcare needs. Community health workers are an absolutely vital component of the health systems that we all depend on. Unfortunately, as I'm sure most of the people on this call know too well, we take them for granted. We neglect them. We often assume that community health workers will just fill the gaps without really providing them with the tools to do so. Too often, community health workers are uncounted, unpaid, unsupported, and unprotected. And too often, also, they are invisible and their voices are unheard. Now, this is why this initiative is so important. The new guidance out today on developing a national community health worker master list provides a single source of truth for information on community health workers. And that will enable countries to ensure that country community health workers are counted, are paid, are supported, are protected, and are heard. And so 
we at the Global Fund are proud to have worked alongside many partners to contribute to the development of this guidance. And we really look forward to working with countries to adapt and implement it in their countries because community health workers count. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Maureen from UNICEF to give an overview of the new guidance. Maureen, over to you. Thank you so very much, Iti Sands. Always inspiring to um, hear you speak and championing um, the community health workforce. I will um, go ahead and share my screen um, so that we can get this on the road. Um, are you able to see my screen? Okay. All right. So once again, colleagues, just a bit of housekeeping before we jump in. Um, we have live translation going on. Please go to the bottom of your screen and select the channel, uh, French or English. And um, noting that when we do have our speakers, some of them will be speaking in French. So you want to be sure that you are able to listen right through. We also invite you to put your questions in the chat. We have a team that will be responding to the questions. And if there is time, we will be able to address them in the course of um, the, the webinar today. My name is Maureen uh, Momani. I am the community health lead from UNICEF based at our headquarters office. But today I truly stand um, to represent the team that was behind um, the, the development of this guidance. It is a team drawn um, from the institutions highlighted on the slide, as well as a broad array of contributors spanning over 50 organizations and from our ministries of health. So my task today is, as Peter has highlighted, is to share with you a synopsis of the guidance. I will not go in depth, but maybe set the stage for, for you know, the dialogue with the ministries of health and also with other stakeholders and inspire you to look into the guidance itself. We'll also get a chance to hear from one of our great community health worker herself, uh, Margaret, and just listen to her perspectives on this. So let's jump right in. Let's get the jargon out of the way. What is a community health worker master list? It's a single source of truth that contains the data elements required to uniquely identify, effectively describe, enumerate, locate, and contact all community health workers in the country. And as you will see and will discuss and hear from the countries as well, that it is critical to have this information to support strategic planning and broader health system functions. So this particular guidance is designed to support ministries of health, national governments to develop a functional and institutionalized community health worker master list. One that is inclusive, one that is routinely updated, and when stored in a registry allows it to be interoperable, well-governed, routinely used and sustainable. So hoping that we are clear on master list versus registry, let's then step and ask ourselves the question, but why? Why a community health worker master list? And I think um, Edie Sands has touched on this in his opening remarks, that although we recognize the critical role that community health workers play in delivering primary health care, a conduit to achieving universal health coverage, unfortunately, the data on the current number of community health workers from a global or even regional perspective remains generally incomplete. And when you go a step lower to country level, even this data does not always exist. And when they do, they're probably out of date. And here we give you an example. The current estimates of community health workers are at about over 3 million. And this is drawn from the national health worker accounts. The data is only available for 75 countries for the period ending 2019. But we know that this particular CADA has a high turnover rapid deployment with community health workers transitioning in and out. So it would be clear in our minds that even the data that we're looking at is likely outdated. Let's take it a step further into country level. 
at country level, we know that it is essential to have these numbers, but uncertainties of these numbers, the numbers of community health workers and their locations may prevent or delay the planning and implementation of community health activities. And I won't go in depth because these are the questions that we want to ask our panelists today. But what the slide illustrates here is just some examples. Say for example, in an emergency response, we know that community health workers are critical in delivering door-to-door -door services, such as, for example, SBCC, social behavioral change um, activities, or perhaps contact tracing. And for us to be able to deploy the community health workers to address this or for this effective emergency response, it is critical to have the information on their status. So are they active or not? Where are they? And what is their catchment area? In the absence of this information, you can already begin to see that the emergency response will either be delayed or ineffective. Similarly, when it comes to health service accessibility, now looking on the right side of the slide, when sub, particularly subnational units are looking at addressing coverage issues, they need to know, okay, which catchment areas are perhaps do not have access to a health facility? Well, then the question is, if they do not have access to a health facility, do they have a community health worker or workers in place? So to identify and address these accessibility gaps, then data is required and not just any data, not just numbers, but also geolocation data. In the absence of this data, it would mean that there would need to be some sort of quick undertaking of data collection and geomapping of these community health workers. Same for community health worker payments. We know that we want to compensate the community health workers for the work that they are doing. In the absence of a list that has the true numbers of these community health workers that reflects the services they are providing, the training, certification, and so on, would hamper such payments to be done in an effective, effectively and in time. Same for procurement, and I won't touch on this because this is actually, this issue of procurement is what stemmed, is where the development or the genesis of this guidance actually stemmed from, and it's a good example of, um, of a use case for um, Community Health Worker Master List. So all in all to say, the lack of visibility into the community health workforce data impedes progress towards effective institutionalization of community health workers. When it comes to human resources for health, and I won't go into so much detail here, again, because we will hear examples from our countries, we see that to address payroll concerns, to address planning, recruitment, and training, to address procurement and distribution, because these are you know, the HRH needs and beyond, what we end up seeing happening at country level is that several lists then start to emerge to address these needs at an ad hoc basis. And the difficulty with this is that they are often not georeferenced, and then at the same time, they are not often um, maintained in the long run with a lot of duplication, and of course, as a result, misuse of resources. So what then is the solution to this? The solution would be the development of a one key source of truth for this data. And this is what we are calling the Community Health Worker Master List, which then would capture accurately and reliably the data on the community health workers that would then be critical for strategic decision-making. When we host it within a registry, it allows the data to not only be kept current, but also shareable. So let me just go through some bits on the guidance and just touch on um, a few key things of what you will see within the guidance itself. So the guidance document describes the principles for the establishment of a national georeferenced master list and proposes a seven step process of activities for generating, applying and maintaining the list. Within each step, there is a decision checklist as well as key considerations for planning and implementation. We note that this guidance complements other resources and we urge 
the, um, our stakeholders to use it consult concertedly with other existing guidance. We, we flag these and avail links to these resources in the actual guidance itself. I think I would point out the master facility list resource package is one that goes closely hand in hand with this, as well as the strategic, the guidance of strategic information for community health workers, the community health worker aim to, as well as the WHO's uh, guidance on optimizing community health workers or programs. How did we go about in the development of this guidance? Here, I will just flag that um, we started off the guidance development process was initiated to respond to the urgent need to count and identify community health workers for the purposes of providing personal protective equipment and vaccination during the COVID-19 pandemic. We were faced with the question of, well, if we want to provide PPEs to the community health workers, who are they? How many are they? Where are they? When we reached out to countries, we realized that quite a number did not have this data. Why? Because they didn't have a master list in place. And where the master list was in place, perhaps it was not hosted in a registry, it's not kept up to date. So we embarked on this guidance development process as a team of stakeholders, partners, um, outlined on the slide, but also in close consultation with ministries of health, including Ethiopia, Kenya, Mali, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Togo, Uganda, and Zambia. And hats off to these colleagues and beyond from our ministries that gave us input and were very candid in speaking to us about the challenges in country that really informed the development of this. And then we consulted with a broader team of technical experts who helped us in fine tuning the content. So when we look at the seven step process, and I will not um, you know, go into the details of this, I think suffice to say that the in-country process is supported by global enabling factors, which um, we don't go into depth in highlighting within the guidance, but we are cognizant of that. The need to collaborate with partners, the need um, to align community health funding streams to support harmonization of activities at country level, but also the need to have guidelines and minimum standards for lists and registries, which is what this guidance then comes in to address. With regards to the seven step process, we start off by, you know, and each of the steps is, is explained in detail, but just to say, it starts with recommending that countries should assess the current state, then look at the governance structure, this is key. And you will see that when we go in country, a lot of bottlenecks surround this governance issue. But when this is unlocked, it then sets the stage for strong leadership and sustainability of not only the list, but also the registry. Then there is target state definition, basically saying, okay, then what needs to be in place for us to have the master list? What SOPs, for example, do we need to develop so that we can have um, the, the master list developed and the registry as well. And then step four and five, we recommend happen in tandem where the actual list is generated. And depending on the target state, we may find that where lists exist, we're talking of merging of lists or going out to the fields to collect data where gaps, to address gaps, and then moving this master list to be hosted within a registry. When these are set up, we then move to step six and outline, okay, what needs to be done to allow the list registry to be shareable? So talking about what needs to be done to ensure the registry is interoperable, where does it sit? What are the links that are need? What are the sharing um, uh, you know, protocols that need to be put in place? And then finally, how, do the, how is the master list maintained and used over time? So these steps are, again, in the guidance and within each, we talk about the stakeholders involved, the planning process, as well as the implementation for each of the steps. We recognize that countries are at different steps. A country may start at any step, at, at different points within those seven steps. And this really differs based on the maturity level of the community health system in a given country. And that maturity level itself may have variation when it comes to the ingredients that are needed to formulate a functional 
institutionalized national georeferenced master list. Look, we, we are aiming to get at a list that is, as you can see from the first end of the slide, a list that is inclusive, routinely updated, stored in a registry, interoperable, secure, governed, routinely used and sustainable. That's where we want to get. But we recognize that for us to get there, we need to have identified use cases. We need to have identified, so what is the use of this data? We need to have a master list itself in place. The master list needs to be hosted within the registry and there needs to be a supportive environment to do so. These are the ingredients of the master list hosted within the registry. But within each of these, we note that countries are at different places and I'll just use one to explain what I mean. So for example, for the master list, that is the second rule. We recognize that a country may have multiple community health worker lists when they're doing their state definition or assessment. They may realize, oh, this partner has this list, or oh, this particular region has developed a list. When they look at those lists, they may have different data elements and the minimum data elements may not be included necessarily. Or they may be at subnational level or not you know, for the entire, uh, do not cover all the community health workers. Whereas in a different country, we may have actually a national georeferenced community health worker master list with minimum data elements in place, but because it is not within a registry, it is not updated. So the list is there, but it needs to be updated and validated. So you see the actions that these two countries would take differ. The urge here is to say, whichever point the country is at, at least one or two steps can be taken to move to the next level. When it comes to um, the use, remember the first row when I talked of use cases, we urge countries to take a step back before going into defining the contents of the master list to ask what was, the, what was going to be the use of this, um, of this list. And of course, you'll see that the use cases are many. There are multiple uses that um, uh, can come up. And here we try to illustrate some of these. In the interest of time, I won't delve into them and save these to here from the country themselves. The guidance also offers some direction on what would be the minimum data elements that go into the master list. We recommend that there should be a set, a set, um, set number of uh, data elements that allow us to at least uniquely identify and locate and contact the community health workers. But beyond that, there is also a list available that countries can look at and say, okay, well, if I'm going to use um, my data, for example, for equipment and commodity, then perhaps these are the data elements that I need to include. If I'm going to use this for performance, maybe assessment, then these are the data that I need, data elements that I need to include. So really the secondary data or the addition of data elements is really dependent on the use cases, but the guidance sets forth um, suggestions or puts forward a list of the relevant data elements to be included, but noting that recommendations are made for what we call a minimum set of data elements. When it comes to the registry, um, we say that a registry can exist within a health worker registry, which would be ideal. But we know that this is really dependent on the policy in a given country. But nonetheless, if it is not within the health worker registry, it should be complementary and support information exchange with other registries. We've asked this question before of which um, technology or you know, which is the correct platform. And we say, what we recommend is that there should be a good assessment done, including um, end user research, um, to determine the best choice. And we do put some of these ingredients and directions in the guidance document for consideration. We put forward where other systems that can be uh, not really integrate, either integrated or linked uh, to the community health worker registry as well to allow um, the use of the data in an effective way. So having said this, I will pause here. I hope that is sufficient to encourage us to delve into the guidance itself and pull out and explore some more. But because we, you know, we, we can't go into full depth here, we will pause and, and try and hand over to countries at this point um, and discuss the next steps from that perspective. 
we are looking at ministries of health to use the guidance um, to assess the current situation with their master lists against the maturity continuum towards institutionalizing a national georeference list, adapt the seven step process at whichever time point they may be based on the maturity of their system. And of course, use the guidance to inform policies linked to the development of this master list and registries to further strengthen the broader community health system. So with this, I will halt here and stop sharing my screen so that we can transition to our um, speakers from our ministries of health. And I will be asking them a um, simple set of questions. I will be reaching out to them to ask them to describe the current status of the community health worker master list in their country, hear from them what it is used for and uh, who uses it and what is their vision um, uh, going forward. To start us off, maybe I will start with um, um, our colleagues from, maybe from Kenya. Um, Mr. Wanyongo, it's great to have you. Um, maybe you. You, could, you could start by talking to us a bit from the Kenya perspective. Could you describe the current status of your community health worker master list and registry really in brief and tell us who the users are and um, whether it is currently hosted in the registry. Perhaps let's tackle that first bit from you and then we will transition to the other countries as well. Over to you, Mr. Yeah. Thank you, Maureen. And a good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So for us in Kenya, uh, the candidates of uh, community health master list, community health workers master list, is that um, we have made some attempts to put together this list working in partnership with our partner IntraHealth on this. So we've covered 15 counties out of 47 counties in the country where the listing has, uh, has taken place. And so we have uh, this list. There were plans to have this list hosted in uh, IRIS, the Integrated Human Resource Innovation System, but that did not happen. Unfortunately, the project uh, in Indohel that was handling this work with us ended before we did this. So that's work in progress and also still pending. And uh, so I would say it's work in progress. We have done this partially. The list is not in a registry yet, uh, but there are discussions around having a registry and there are plans for this year, which I'll be responding to in your third question. Thank you. Mr. Wanyungu, thank you for that. Before you, you move on, who uses the list? Or why was there, yes. why, why was there a need to establish the list in the first place? Yeah, so the need arose out of uh, the realization that it was hard for us to know the community health workers we had in the country and where they were and who they were. So we set out to determine who these community health workers are, where they are, and uh, their demographics, their education, their gender, their level, of, I mean, their training in community health and all that. So we put together a listing and it's a, an Excel sheet to help us collect this data, which uh, was done jointly between us, Ministry of Health and Intra Health in the 15 counties. And so this information is being used primarily by us as government, Ministry of Health, and also partners we work with who may wish to, con to know who and where these uh, community health workers are in the country. And this list became very useful to us, particularly last year, when we secured the PPEs and we wanted to distribute them to the end users who are the community health workers. So we referred this list to get to know how many pieces of PPEs would go to which county. And so this list has been very, very useful to us as a government and also to partners. So we use it both as government and also, uh, and also with our partners. Thank you, Mr. Wanyungu. Thank you. And we hear you. Thank you for that concrete example on the fact that the list was used to support procurement of PPEs for the community health workers and to inform the distribution of those PPEs. Thank you. We'll put Kenya. Uh, thank you for that experience from Kenya. Let's transition um, to Dr. Kone. Dr. Kone, we would ask you to please answer the same question. What is the status of community health worker master list? Um, and, 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 and who are the users and why, why did you think about developing um, a master list? Over to you, Dr. Kone.
Did we lose Dr. Kona? Okay, I think we lost Dr. Kone. I hope you can still hear me, colleagues. Dr. Wanyam, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you, Maureen, very okay. well. All right, okay. Yes. So whilst we wait for Dr. Kone to come back, I think, yes, he may be having connection issues. I'm sure he'll be back. Maybe let's hear from Dr. Kampaure. Uh, Dr. Kampaure, what is the situation in Burkina Faso? Do you have a community health worker master list at national level? And if so, what, um, what is the genesis of this list? Over. Merci à tous. Moi, c'est Monsieur Comporé Paul. Je suis attaché de santé. Comme vous avez dit, les soins de santé primaires, c'était des stratégies de développement au niveau communautaire pour les zones difficilement accessibles. Ainsi, en 2011-2013, nous avons eu l'institutionnalisation de la santé communautaire et en 2016, nous avons eu un fort engagement politique du gouvernement burkinabé qui nous a autorisé à recruter deux ASBC dans tous les villages administratifs. Ainsi, avec des directives de recrutement appuyées par l'administration territoriale, nous avons à la fin du recrutement eu 17 668 agents de santé à base communautaire au niveau national. Et ces agents de santé à base communautaire ont été formés, ils ont été équipés, Et actuellement, ils ont de la motivation, une motivation monétaire et une motivation non monétaire. Donc, depuis longtemps, nous utilisons des feuilles Excel pour gérer ces ASBC recrutés, avoir leur statut de fonctionnalité, avoir leur sexe, leur âge, surtout pour le paiement, parce que c'est ceux qui sont actifs, c'est ceux qui sont opérationnels que nous payons à la fin de chaque mois une somme, une prime de 20 000 francs pour eux tous. Ce qui posait un problème pour nous, parce qu'avec les fichiers Excel, il y a beaucoup de règles qui s'introduisaient, il y a beaucoup de pertes de données. Ainsi, en 2020, nous avons trouvé nécessaire qu'il fallait digitaliser cette liste. On a commencé le processus en 2020 qui n'a pas abouti. Et actuellement, en 2021, nous avons élaboré actuellement une liste nationale qui est qui est hébergé dans un registre. Et nous sommes actuellement en train de déployer la plateforme à tous les niveaux pour que les gens puissent l'utiliser. Et ce registre est utilisé par tout le personnel à tous les niveaux, que ce soit les agents de santé, que ce soit les partenaires, que ce soit les autres ministères qui ont besoin de leurs services dans les localités et surtout au niveau communautaire, surtout avec la pandémie, que nous les utilisons à tous les niveaux pour les sensibilisations. Voilà rapidement ce que nous avons au niveau du Burkina Faso par rapport au registre national des agents de santé à base communautaire. Thank you so much, Dr. Kompare. That is really um, a very uh, a different approach that uh, Burkina Faso used. It was in response to payment of the community health workers trying to address that. So payroll concerns to ensure that you have the right number of community health workers you know who are active to facilitate their payment. And then you move to digitalize this list to ensure that it is kept up to date. And that you're telling us that it is used across the board, across um, all system levels, including other health workers um, at the moment. And we will come to you so that we can understand a bit about the challenges, but I can see Dr. Kone is back and maybe he can also set the stage as um, the others have done for the situation in, um, in Mali. Dr. Kone, please come in and tell us about the status of community health worker master lists in, in Mali. Over to you. Ok, mais merci beaucoup. <coughs> merci. Le Mali se réjouit d'être parmi les participants à ce forum extrêmement important sur la santé communautaire. Et en termes de liste, quelle est la situation actuelle En fait, nous avons au niveau national pas une liste standard. Nous avons plusieurs sources pour avoir la situation des, des ASC. Et la dernière revue que le ministère de la Santé organise avec la participation de tous les différents niveaux du système de santé, district, région, 
au niveau national, nous avons, état, nous avons la fait la situation que nous avons aujourd'hui 3108 ASC formés, équipés et fonctionnels sur le terrain, sur l'étendue du pays. Sauf la partie nord, qui, a, qui est très peu pourvue en, en agent de santé communautaire. Maintenant, malgré les efforts, nous faisons le constat qu'à travers plusieurs sources, nous avons la situation. La première source, c'est le 10-2, que, que tout le monde connaît, qui est le système d'information sanitaire national, où nous avons la situation de, des ASC. On a aussi le, un logiciel de gestion des ressources humaines qui est utilisé par la direction des ressources humaines au niveau national. Et euh, nous avons aussi mis en, en application une approche santé communautaire supervision dédiée qui permet qui, où c'est du personnel qualifié dédié à la supervision des agents de santé communautaire. Et cette source aussi permet d'avoir une situation des ASC opérationnels sur le terrain parce que les superviseurs dédiés sont censés superviser tous les agents de santé fonctionnels une fois par mois. Et aussi, en 2000, chaque année, nous avons cette revue nationale qui permet d'avoir une situation détaillée de tous les ASC fonctionnels dans les districts sanitaires du pays. Et y compris, cette revue réunit l'ensemble des régions du pays, l'ensemble des districts, y compris les régions du Nord. Et aussi, il faut reconnaître qu'en 2021, la, la, cette direction nationale a réorganisé avec l'appui de l'OMS. Il y a une base de données de l'OMS qui est errance où nous avons la situation des établissements de santé. Donc, et en 2021, nous avons décidé d'inscrire le site ASC, qui est le lieu de travail de l'ASC, comme une zone, un établissement de santé au niveau communautaire qui permet au moins d'avoir la situation de tous les ASC fonctionnels. Et ce site est géoréférencié. Donc, ce qui fait que nous avons plusieurs sources, mais au niveau national, ma sous-direction utilise comme base de données, la, la liste nominative référenciée de, après la revue annuelle. Et cette, cette, liste annuelle cette liste annuelle des ASC, elle n'est pas régulièrement mise en œuvre, mais revue, mais sa revue est simplement annuelle et ça se fait avec l'ensemble des parties prenantes, y compris les partenaires techniques et financiers qui utilisent ces ASC sur le terrain. Et, mais chacun de ces systèmes, a ses, chaque, chacune de ces sources a ses avantages et ses inconvénients. Par rapport à la gestion de, la, le système d'information de la gestion des ressources humaines, c'est la direction des ressources humaines qui l'utilise, les autres ne l'utilisent pas. Mais la liste nationale, la liste après la revue annuelle, c'est cette liste que nous partageons avec tous nos partenaires, et c'est elle qui mais elle n'est pas géoréférenciée. Donc, nous n'avons pas encore mis en place un registre standard qui fédère l'ensemble de ces différentes sources. Et je crois que c'est vers ça que nous sommes en train d'évoluer. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kone. Um, it is a, you describe a complex situation in Mali, but what is very clear is that there is an appetite and there is a need. Um, there are multiple use cases. There are multiple uses for which this data is um, it needs to be applied. And this is calling for Hence, the you know whether it be HRH, whether it, you've talked about supervision needs, you've talked about um, you've touched a bit on uh, the, the the remuneration distribution, and um, I mean, and you've you've said multiple sources, multiple lists, not uh, reviewed annually, and uh, you're looking towards bringing them together and hosting them in one place in a registry as the next step. We'll come back to you on that, so you can speak a bit more on that vision. Um, but coming back, circle back to, to, to Kenya, um, to speak about, you said that um, 15 counties, the list is in place. Uh, you're thinking about how do you move this to a registry? How do you expand this to the rest of the counties? Could you speak a bit about that vision? And you know, after your reflection on the guidance, how do you think this will be applied or which step do you think, you don't have to speak, you can speak, generically, but which, at which point do you think Kenya is and, and moving towards? And, uh, you know, because there are partners, there are stakeholders here. What would you say are your immediate next steps? Over to you, Mr. Yeah. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you, Maureen. So for us in Kenya, our next steps in uh, build up to having a community health worker master list in a registry is that uh, we would like to cover more counties. And uh, as a ministry, we have uh, to get some little funding from Global Fund towards this effort. We have some little money towards this. And uh, secondly, we have had discussions with uh, partners in the country uh, in regard to having this list uh, domiciled in Kenya Master Community Health Unit list, which is way best, so that uh, that way then we know, we'll run away from the temptation to have a, a silo registry for community health worker master list, but instead right onto an existing registry. And so we shall be discussing further with our partners in the country to see how we build on to Kenya Master Community Health Unit uh, list to host uh, this community health worker master list. And so our partners in the country are um, excited at this development and we've been discussing and we continue discussing. We should be having a meeting soon with the, between the minister and the partners to discuss on how one, we domesticate. We already discussed this in our platform for partners to commit health, how we domesticate this guideline that we are launching today uh, to contextualize them to the Kenyan context and use that to look at our to look at our community health worker master list data elements and uh, just have a guidance on how we implement this and ultimately have the list onto an existing registry. So the discussions and our hopes for expanding and improving this listing in the country this year. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wanyongo. Very clear and very clear that you have the master community health unit list. And this is what you're hoping that you will expand and host the community health worker um, master list there so that there is that linkage. So it is clear when you click on the community health unit, we are clear on who are the community health workers attached to that particular unit. And you've spoken of um, the, you know, adapting uh, the guidance to your context and using that to move the next steps forward and your partner engagement and um, source of funding. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Wanyungu. Um, to you, um, uh, Dr. Kampare, if you can also speak um, from Burkina Faso's uh, perspective, what are the next steps? What do you see uh, Burkina needs to do to move um, to the institutionalization of community health worker master lists, expanding them and hosting them within a registry? What do you envision? Donc pour nous, bon, c'est déjà une liste nationale qui existe et ce recrutement se trouve dans tout le pays. Nous avons 13 districts sanitaires avec 70 13 régions sanitaires avec 70 districts. Nous avons cette liste à tous les niveaux. Ce qui est comme défi pour nous actuellement eh, par rapport à la géolocalisation. Puisque actuellement les listes sont hébergées sur un site web qu'on peut actualiser. Donc nous voulons à travers des coordonnées GPS des ASBC reliées au CSPS, leur, forma, leur formation sanitaire là où ils sont reliés, liées au village. Donc, avec la géolocalisation, surtout avec les partenaires, dans ce registre, nous allons attribuer des identifiants uniques aux ASBC et des codes uniques qui seront identifiés. Le problème qui est là, c'est la mobilité aussi de ces agents de santé à base communautaire. Ils sont très, très, très mobiles. C'est ça qui est un défi pour nous aussi qu'il faudrait qu'on voit comment les sédentariser, surtout que la motivation n'est pas tellement importante. Nous comptons surtout sur nos partenaires pour pouvoir continuer et surtout que la plateforme soit maintenue avec une bonne maintenance et que tout le monde puisse l'utiliser et que à chaque instant, comme vous le dites, quand on clique seulement, qu'on puisse avoir toutes les informations à jour pour tous les ASBC dans tout le pays. Actuellement, pour 2022, ce sont nos défis. Et surtout, bon, comme vous savez, nous, nos, nos, nos ASBC sont motivés. Il faut qu'on voit la pérennisation de cette motivation à tous les niveaux, parce qu'ils sont 17 600 et quelques pour le pays. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Compaore. Well noted. Burkina Faso, the list is in place. The next step is to georeference um, what exists and to ensure that it is well maintained. Very clear, succinct um, next steps. Um, over to you, Dr. Kone, if you could speak 
also on what are the next steps for Mali in, a, in you know in a clear, concise way when it comes to master list and registry for the Mali context. Over. Merci. Je, je voulais quand même signaler que nous avons la liste que nous avons à la fin de l'année par rapport à travers la revue annuelle est déjà une liste nationale qui est, qui est partagée avec tous les partenaires. Donc cette liste, elle est disponible, mais nous faisons la revue une fois par an avec tous les districts sanitaires. Au Mali, nous avons plus de 65 districts sanitaires. Nous avons plus de 11 régions aujourd'hui. Donc, l'ensemble des parties prenantes avec les partenaires techniques et financiers participent à cette revue nationale. C'est ça notre liste qui n'est actualisée qu'une fois par an. Maintenant, comme le Burkina, on a aussi, elle n'est pas géoréférencié. Donc, nous pensons que les prochaines étapes avec les, les autres sources, c'est de voir comment, dans le nouveau guide que nous allons mettre en place, comment aller à la, à la, à la mise en place un système de géoreférencement qui aiderait à mieux gérer les, ces agences sur le terrain. Et l'autre chose que je voulais ajouter, c'est que, bon, comme, comme le, les autres pays, la motivation de ces agents de santé, qui sont très importants sur le terrain, elle reste encore un défi à relever parce qu'au Mali, nous sommes en train de mettre le cadre réglementaire et législatif pour que l'État puisse financer définitivement la prise en charge de ces agents de santé communautaires. Sinon, pour l'instant, c'est les partenaires techniques et financiers. Donc, leur stabilité est liée à la disponibilité du financement pour leur motivation. Et nous avons à peu près les mêmes montants comme au Burkina pour payer nos agents de santé communautaires. Donc, cette liste que nous avons, qu'on peut l'appeler déjà registre, doit être géoréférenciée et doit aussi être mise dans un truc électronique. Et je crois que nous sommes en train de voir avec... On, on a un, un, un bout de financement avec le Fonds mondial pour voir au niveau de la cellule de planification sanitaire nationale comment mettre en place une carte numérique, sanitaire numérique, qui permettrait de, de géoreférencer définitivement tous les ASC et d'avoir un, un registre standard. Mais nous comptons beaucoup sur ce nouveau guide qui va nous aider à, à aller définitivement et à actualiser cette liste et de façon soutenable pour une meilleure gestion des ASC au Mali. Merci. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Kone. Very clear as well. Moving to georeferencing and championing for the payment of community health workers. My esteemed panelists, we wish we had more time to delve in, but I think you have given us a taste and a flavor of the situation in country, and we appreciate your time. I'm sure colleagues will be reaching out to you. So thank you, um, Mr. Wanyungu, Dr. Kompaure, Dr. Kone, thank you so much for your time and for the colleagues that have worked with you to ensure that um, uh, we, can, we can have you on our panel. Um, at this point, I'll transition. We will have uh, Margaret, our esteemed community health worker, come in and give us snippet of perspectives from uh, the community health worker standpoint. Over to you, Margaret. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, privilege. Uh, we are really honored. We as the community health workers feel so honored, thrilled and so excited to participate in the community health workers master list launch. For the first time ever, we are participating in a very important event. And most importantly, taking the microphone, sitting at the front and speaking for ourselves. Indeed, what an unforgettable day, the 20th of January, 2022, for the first, for the, for the, for the level one of, the, of health systems, the health structure that is at the basement, the community, health workers. There are so many important uh, events that we attended, but this is the most important. And I'm going to speak about the importance of the community health workers master list, according to the community health workers perspective. I'm going to speak about five important uh, steps that, uh, that 
supports this community health workers master list. Number one, if we don't count, we are not there. The power of data is key in both strengthening health workforce, professionalizing the community health worker, and better understanding the impact of health outcomes and inform policy decision. Number two, it will help in proper equipping and training and enhance equity in distribution of resources, looking into the marginalized groups of the community health workers. Number three, the community health workers have been the cornerstone of primary health care across the communities. We are driven by passion, working even beyond our job description, yet nobody recognizes that our bank accounts are dormant. We believe that the community health workers master list will, will, will enhance and will influence the speed of opening up our bank accounts again and very fast. I want to talk about PPEs and protections. Many other times, the community health workers have fallen down during the line of duty out in the community. If we were not provided with the, with the PPEs that we need, we can easily contaminate the vaccines the health commodities that we are going to distribute even in the community and even contaminate the, the very same health workers that we are working with in the hospitals. Many have been hurt in the line of duty, but nothing has been done. Why? Because I quote, we exist, yet we don't exist, end of quote. Number three, I want, uh, number four, I want to speak about uh, what we believe the Community Health Workers Master List will do for us. The Community Health Workers Master List will be a solution to this problem that has been dragging the health system for so long behind. So we, we, we believe that this Community Health Workers Master List is going to solve this problem. Number five. We believe that this community health workers master list is very important because this is the beginning of the process of sealing the gaps. The gaps that have caused serious consequences in the health systems. When you don't seal the basement of a building, when you don't seal the basement of a structure, however strong the fifth floor is, the whole structure is in danger. I'm speaking about the health structure. If you don't strengthen the basement of the health structure, however strong the level five is, the whole health structure is in danger. Community health workers must be paid, protected, empowered, trained, and counted. I ask the leaders to continue investing in the community health workers master list because this is strengthening health systems thank you very much thank you so much uh, margaret excellent excellent so many uh, words i take from you and i'm sure we all do if we don't count and we don't exist we hear you loud and clear thank you colleagues for your patience we will move to close um and we'll invite raj Raj, please, over to you. Thank you, Maureen and Margaret. Thank you for those just powerful, powerful words. I, as a doctor, I've learned, I have to say, more about caring for patients when making home visits with community health workers like Margaret than I did at any other time in my career. Uh, I, I've learned from Margaret, like many of you have, that outbreaks start and stop in communities. And that's why the President's Malaria Initiative, which I have the privilege of leading, uh, is going to be one of your early adopters of this community health work worker master list. Uh, let me let me tell you why. Strengthening the systems that support community health workers is a key part of USAID's new vision for health system strengthening 2030 and the new US President's Malaria Initiative strategy called End Malaria Faster that we released in October. As part of the PMI strategy, we have changed our policy 
to allow the use of PMI funds for the first time to pay community health workers wherever countries are serious about creating policies and plans to employ them. Abolishing the pay gap for community health workers isn't just the right thing to do. We, we've known that. It's the smart thing to do. And as we explain in PMI's new guidance today, which I'll ask my colleague Annie to share in the chat, the, the, the evidence is clear. We've, we, for every dollar we invest in paying, training, and equipping community health workers, $10 is returned to society in the form of extend, extended life years, outbreaks prevented or mitigated, and the jobs that get created. So when we speak to our finance ministries, our presidents, our funder community, uh, we've got to make clear this is not a cost. It's an investment with a high return. It's a fast way, perhaps one of the fastest ways to create jobs coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic to help us prepare for the next pandemic. But let me be clear, PMI and our partner countries can't pay these workers if we don't know where they are, who they are, or where they work. So I want to thank Global Fund, uh, my dear friend Peter, colleagues on the line from Kenya, Zambia, and Mali, uh, Margaret, and all the community health workers who've demanded to be counted and will continue to do so, and all the partners who are committed to um, using this master list and the many who created it. Uh, in many ways, it's a national registry of community health workers, and we uh, are sharing this implementation guidance on the master list for community health workers with our teams, uh, all in, in the 27 countries we work in in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. In, in closing, I'll leave you with this. Um, the world has counted on community health workers to extend primary health care and to help fight epidemics from malaria and HIV AIDS to Ebola and COVID-19. But while we've counted on community health workers, we all agree we can do better at actually counting them.